All right, finally, let's talk about some of the convergence properties of the Fourier series. We've alluded to some of this before about pointwise equality and things like that. Let's just talk about a few items to, to clarify some of these things and also just behavior, the coefficients uh, for large n. So first item says that the Fourier series converges to the value of f of t at every point of continuity where f of t has both a right hand and left hand derivative. So if we have a signal f of t that's continuous at some point and it's well behaved there, meaning it has a right hand and left hand derivative, you can go Google on what right hand and left hand derivatives mean, basically just the slope at that point, either way that you come at it is a nice well-defined quantity, then the Fourier series is going to converge at that point. So lots of places the Fourier series does actually converge pointwise, and basically the points at which that happens are points where it's continuous and kind of this well-behaved smooth function. So usually the way I like to think of it is if I have a nice smooth function, my Fourier series representation will actually converge there in terms of a pointwise equality. It's things get interesting when we start having discontinuities. So that's what point two talks about. Let's say I have an f of t that does have a discontinuity. So there's this kind of this jump. I'm going along, all of a sudden I'm discontinuous and I jump. If that's the case, what happens in terms of the Fourier series representation is the Fourier series actually converges to the mean of the limits approach from the right and the left. So whatever the value is that you get to the signal coming from the left, some number, coming from the right, you get some other number, right? Because it's discontinuous there, there's this gap. The Fourier series is gonna to converge to the middle of those two values. So it's not gonna to converge to either the right side or the left side, it's gonna pick this kind of average value in the middle. So that's good to know. Point three tells us something that's pretty useful. Basically, if you give me a signal f of t, and it's already written as a sum of trig functions, you know, cosine of this plus sine of this plus cosine of this, etc., and it's periodic, so some periodic signal that's a sum of sines and cosines, then this is already its own Fourier series. So sometimes you're given a signal that is already written as a sum of sines and cosines, and you can just do simple trig to manipulate it into one of our forms and just know right away what its trigonometric or compact trigonometric Fourier series representation is. So that's kind of nice to know. All right, these last few items all have to do with kind of convergence properties of the coefficients and how the coefficients behave for large values of n or k. So this first one talks about how they decay. And this says that the coefficients of the kth harmonic always decrease in magnitude at least as fast as one over k for sufficiently large k. So this basically puts a lower bound on the rate of decay. My coefficients as k is getting large, you know, the kth, the k plus one, k plus two, the magnitude is gonna go down with a k in the denominator at least that fast. Some of the examples we've done, we've seen actually like, you know, n squareds in the denominator, which means they decay much faster than that, but this is the slowest that we would ever decay. Point five tells us an example of when we might not see them decay faster than this, but decay at that rate, and that occurs when we have any discontinuities. So if we have a discontinuity in the period that we're looking at, you know, that time interval t naught, then the coefficients can decrease no faster than one over k. So anytime we have this discontinuity, we're gonna have a divide by n in our term, and one over n is as fast as they're going to go down. Six tells us kind of the opposite case of five. So five says, if you have continu discontinuities, you're only gonna decay at this slowest possible rate. This tells us how fast we might go. And it has to do with how smooth the function is. It says if the nth derivative is the first derivative with a discontinuity, and if all the derivatives up to then satisfy our Dirichlet conditions, then the Fourier series coefficients go to zero as one over k to the n plus one for sufficiently large k. So this right here, one over k to the n plus one, if n was five, that would be decaying with a, you know, by a factor of one over k to the fifth. That's a very fast decay rate as a function of k. When, when are these conditions going to be met? They're essentially going to be met when I have a really smooth, highly differentiable signal. So if I have a signal f of t and I can take derivative after derivative after derivative and keep getting these very smooth and well-behaved functions, I'm gonna end up with coefficients that decay very, very fast. 
kind of the extreme case is what if I give you f of t just as a cosine? What if f of t was cosine omega naught t? Well, I can take derivatives of that for forever, right? Co derivative of cosine is sine, derivative of sine is cosine, cosine is sine, forever, which means that my coefficients decay basically at 1 over k to the infinity, which means I don't even have any coefficients, I just have the one coefficient. Well, hey, that makes sense because f of t equals cosine omega naught is already written in Fourier series representation. There is only one coefficient. So really six is getting at when I have very smooth functions, the decay rate is very high. And I don't need a lot of high harmonics to represent the signal because I already have such a smooth signal itself. All right, number seven, this is back to discontinuities. We've looked at examples where when we have a discontinuity, we get this kind of oscillation at the discontinuity. And this point right here is really just providing the name of that phenomenon. People call this the Gibbs phenomenon. So when we see that oscillation in our Fourier series representation, that's what's known as the Gibbs phenomenon. Point eight gives us some information about this Gibbs phenomenon. Basically what's interesting is anytime we have one of these discontinuities, as we plot our Fourier series representation with n terms and we see that oscillatory behavior, the amount of overshoot doesn't really change. The width of it gets narrower and narrower as n gets bigger and bigger, but the amount of overshoot continues to be about 9% no matter how big n gets. Now the width of it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so you can think of this thing oscillating around, it oscillates in a more compact way on the time axis, but how much it overshoots remains the same. Point eight can be visualized right here in this example. So here is a Fourier series representation of a rectangle pulse. So there's this discontinuity at zero, it's discontinuous jumps to one, holds, and then it's discontinuous here again. This ringing right here around that discontinuity is what we call the Gibbs phenomenon. So that's oscillatory behavior is the Gibbs phenomenon. And you can see right here this overshoot, it should be one, but it shot up to about 9%, just like we noted on the previous chart. Here, it shot down to about minus 0.1. You know, it went down about 9%. So the overshoot is about 9%, and the oscillatory behavior, we can see, it's what we call the Gibbs phenomenon. This plot right here was made for n equals 60. If I crank up the number of terms in my Fourier series representation, some good things happen. This looks much more like a perfect rectangle. The oscillatory behavior is still there, but it's much narrower in time. Here it oscillated a lot, very wide. Here it's really compact and compressed. However, the amount of overshoot didn't really change. This peak overshoot value is still at the same amplitude level that it was over there. Now it's compressed like we said, but it still has a 9% overshoot. So that's really just an example of what we saw on the previous slide.